Thank you so much. It's going to be such a letdown from now, so I'm just warning you. Thanks to all of you for coming for this talk. It's about India's Northeast, as we've already been told. <coughs> Late last year, three boys aged 16, 18, and 19 attempted an escape from a militant training camp in the jungles of Burma. They had been taken to the camp of the militant outfit that was banned in India. The rebel group would usually indulge in the ambush of Indian armed forces in the state of Manipur, as we see in this map, bordering Burma, and they would also indulge in extortion. Recruitment of children by this group and many other rebel groups in Manipur is very common, except that no one wants to talk about it and very little work has been done on this standard but uh, relatively new practice of using children, both boys and girls, by armed groups in what is a low intensity conflict. This is something that I've noticed during reporting particularly in Manipur but also in Assam and in Nagaland. Of the three boys that attempted an escape only one managed to find his way back to Manipur. One boy drowned in the Irrawaddy River, and another was caught by the militant group and taken back to the camp. It was last year that I met this woman, Purnamasi. I met her in Imphal in Manipur, and we were talking about her grandson, who was abducted by a militant outfit and taken to Burma three years back. During the course of a long interview, she broke down and expected that my interviewing her will probably lead to her getting her grandson back. Her grandson was lucky and courageous enough to script his own escape. She is the grandmother of the only boy who managed to escape. Johnson, that's his name. He escaped after waiting for three years. Most children who are recruited do not find their way back home. Today our story, as is about two families in Manipur and about other children who are abducted or lured by militant groups and also of those who find it difficult to restart their lives once they come back. But before we come to the story of two girls, Alice and Sana Handi, who were recruited as child soldiers in Manipur, rather abducted, and then sent to training camps in Burma, and what I've witnessed in the course of pursuing the story of child soldiers in Northeast India, we must travel a long way back in time. The conflict that we see today goes back in time and is well documented in the 1905 Assam District Gazetteer's Record that is kept in the third floor of the British Library. Written by B.C. Allen, the ninth volume talks about Naga Hills and Manipur, located at India's Northeast. Allen writes about the British expeditions in these areas and also underlines that these areas are full of pertinacious savages. He also documents the 10 military expeditions into the region by 1850. Each expedition resulted in the slaughter of locals and the 10th expedition alone claimed 100 lives. In fact, an 1873 missive from this gentleman makes explicit the British attitudes towards the people of British India's northeast. That's Dalhousie the British Governor General at that time. As Governor General of India, he wanted to take possession of the hills and establish British sovereignty over the savage inhabitants. His message was simple. Hereafter, and I quote him, hereafter we should confine ourselves to our own ground, protect it as it can and must be protected, not meddle in the feuds or fights of these savages, encourage trade with them as long as they are peaceful towards us, and rigidly exclude them from all communication, either to sell what they have got or to buy what they want if they should become turbulent or troublesome. Many Indians, learning well from their colonial masters, still hold on to the Wild West label of Allen and the idea of Dalhousie about this northeastern extremity of India. This region stays on as a space of legal exception in India, a space where the idea of a multicultural and inclusive India seems to vanish into a space of apathy or indifference and sheer racism. The path of conflict in this region has witnessed various phases over time, but to understand this process of recruitment of children, it is essential in my mind to get an idea of how the phases of conflict 
have changed and often been appropriated by the state. And this tag of a violent space that is attached to this region and how it sustains itself in this corner. India's Northeast is a collection of eight states, 350 communities, and a population close to 40 million. It is a frontier zone, as you can see, and eight states share a porous border of 4,500 kilometer with Burma, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and parts of China. A slender 22 kilometer stretch, that's right above Bangladesh, also called the chicken snack, connects this entire zone to the rest of India. The Northeast, according to many, is seen as some kind of a land's end. The location of the frontier zone and the porous nature of this border has been used for free movement by different rebel units. And much before that used by people in this region to travel, that is changing now with the fencing of the border and at the same breath talks of a trading zone that never seems to materialize. Conflict came to Northeast with the British and then sustained itself during the Second World War when in fact the Naga Hills and Manipur would be in the center of what has now been voted as the Second War's most decisive battle, the Battle of Imphal and Battle of Kohima, which was in fact happening during this time in 1944. In fact, right on this day, on 29th of April in 1944, the battle was taking place near what in Kohima, in Nagaland, what used to be a tennis court and the commissioner's bungalow. It's now maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The Kohima War Cemetery remains a reminder of that battle. It was during this time, in 1944, this woman, later honored by this society, was leading a group of 150 Nagas with ancient muzzle-loading guns combing the jungle for the Japanese as part of the British V-Force. According to Ursula Graham Bauer, I quote her, we were the only thing between the British front line and the Japanese. That's what she'd say. There was enough praise and recognition for her as also the Nagas who fought the British. Ironically, the same Nagas would be fighting another battle with a newly independent India about their freedom and identity, a resistance that over time would spread and also independently show itself in the neighboring areas of Manipur, Mizoram, and Assam, and stays on as a low-intensity conflict even now. Journalist Gavin Young, the person on the left, would trek in the Naga Hills in 1961 and write in detail about the conflict in India's Northeast that began with the idea of not wanting to be a part of a newly independent India, and then through various ups and downs, was forced into a bitter war from the from late 1950s. In the Naga Hills, it was a war that would get many, many volunteers, young men who would join the rebel groups to fight India. Their basic demand to remain free and not join India, as I've been saying. And it was during this time, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958 was introduced in the Naga Hills, an extension of the British Armed Forces Ordinance, this Army Act, unheard of in any other democracy. It allows the armed forces to arrest anyone on suspicion and even shoot to kill and not be tried for such act. The act stays on in almost all of Northeast India. It was introduced as a temporary act to control dissent, but remains even now. An apparent tool of counterinsurgency it alienates more than it removes any friction. 50 years after Gavin Young's report, the conflict, though much reduced, still drags on in India's Northeast. In the last 60 years, the Northeast has seen 117 rebel groups. Out of these, at least 20 are active in operations. In the Indian, in the Indian Home Ministry list of 35 rebel groups banned under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, 11 are from the Northeast. At present, the Indian government is simultaneously in talks with at least 15 rebel groups from the Northeast. Some talks go back as far as 1947. Some negotiations are as recent as 2014. Yet, in all these years, not one round of talks has had a final resolution or put a permanent lid on conflict. The demands of the rebel groups range from a complete breakaway from India to more regional autonomy. 
The root causes of these rebellions are diverse, mostly the idea of resistance against alleged Indian domination and territorial claims gave birth to rebel groups in Nagaland and in Manipur. In Mizoram, a famine and utter neglect by India gave rise to the Mizo National Famine Front in 1966. In Assam, the United Liberation Front of Assam grew out of a resistance movement, the Assam Agitation, that demanded expulsion of illegal migrants from Bangladesh and corrective measures to stop economic exploitation. The state of Manipur remains the worst affected by this conflict. Manipur became a part of India in 1949. Before that, it was a constitutional monarchy. Manipur's merger with India was a forced one. The king of Manipur was put under house arrest and forced to sign the merger treaty with India. There were protests, but it was only in 1964 that Manipur started witnessing organized resistance. The United National Liberation Front was formed in 1964, the idea to achieve independence from India and establish a socialist society. The UNLF had a ready cadre of young boys and girls. They even carried out vigilante justice and did not tolerate crimes against women. The group split on ideological lines, and then came the People's Liberation Army, formed in 1976, then the People's Revolutionary Party of Kang Lepak in 1977. The conflict established itself in Manipur at a time when the Nagas were fighting the Indian state. By 1980, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which was introduced in Nagaland in 1958, was introduced in Manipur to contain this. That's King Bodhachandra, who was the king of Manipur, who was forced to sign the merger treaty with India. From 1980 till now, according to different sources, at least 20,000 people have been killed in Manipur in conflict. In Nagaland, some say the loss of lives is even more. In both states, now the conflict has reduced significantly, but it drags on. For violence that goes beyond data and numbers, and has pitted relatives against each other through state machinations and have injected corruption in this corner. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act remains the shield that gives impunity to the Armed Forces. So without an iota of shame, men, women and children have been killed by state forces, women have been raped, villages burnt, and the idea of Indian citizens from the Northeast being others remains firmly entrenched. It remains entrenched in racism from the so-called mainland Indians or even from Northeasterners towards Indians. Despite an elected government and an electoral process in Manipur that witnesses a voter turnout of around 79%, human security, as I'm saying, remains fragile in Manipur. There are a number of militias today that regard Manipur's merger as illegal and unconstitutional. The constant presence of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act has led to a de facto militarization of Manipur and other northeastern states of India. In 2006, after a visit to Manipur, Henry Jardin, the US Consulate General in Calcutta, mentioned in a secret cable to Washington, D.C., that the general use of Armed Forces Special Powers Act meant that the Manipuris did not have the same rights as other Indian citizens, and restrictions on travel to the state added to a sense of isolation and separation from the rest of India. In fact, in March 2015 this year, the Indian government decided to reject in entirety the suggestions of a report produced 10 years prior by the Justice Jeevan Reddy Committee. It had asked the government to repeal the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The Reddy Committee, had been constituted after the alleged rape and murder of this 32-year-old woman, Thangya Manorama Devi, by Indian paramilitary forces in 2004. Manorama was arrested in the middle of the night by armed forces from her residence on suspicion of being an active cadre of a banned militant outfit in Manipur. She was picked up according to Section 4 of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Section 5 of the Act stipulates that the arrest be handed over to the nearest police station. In flagrant disregard of the law, this was never done. Next morning, Manorama was found dead in an open field with bullet wounds all over her body, including on her genitalia. As claimed by human rights lawyer Nandita Haksar, Manorama was shot in the vagina 
to hide the evidence of the crime. As a mark of protest against the state, two days after her murder, 12 women disrobed in front of the Indian paramilitary headquarters in Imphal, the capital city of Manipur. Naked together, as you can see, they stretched a single length of white cloth that had Indian Army rapists written on it in red paint. The protest organized by the Mayor of Ibis, a prominent women's group in Manipur fighting for civil liberties, and the Apunba Lup, a conglomerate of civil society organizations, brought this murder and the Armed Forces Special Powers Act under the spotlight. At this point, on instructions from India's Prime Minister, Justice Jeevan Reddy was asked to head a five-member committee to review the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Despite the committee's suggestions to repeal the act, it remains in force even now. Caught in this violence, under development seems to be an accepted way of life in Manipur. In the state of Manipur, or even in Nagaland, electricity is available for six to eight to 10 hours in a day, depending on the importance of one, the area one resides in. In fact, only in 2012, the state government in Manipur responded to a public interest litigation about the lack of electricity and promised to provide electricity for eight hours, just one of the various layers that lets underdevelopment and violence be the way of life in this region. According to a petition submitted to India's Supreme Court in October 2012 by Manipur extrajudicial execution victims' families and other NGOs, 1,600 civilians, including 98 children, were killed by security forces in Manipur between 1979 and 2012. Unsurprisingly, such brutality has alienated the locals, aggravated the conflicts, and formed a ready pool of would-be insurgents. Poverty also plays a role. The seven states of Northeast ranks lowest in terms of infrastructure development, and most of the child soldiers are recruited from very poor families. The violence that sustains itself in Manipur, bordering Burma, is split along different tribal and sub-tribal lines and along group affiliations that split along those lines and spread within the hills and valley of Manipur. So Nagas and Kukis dominate the hill, uh, so Nagas and Kukis dominate the hill areas and Maitis are usually in the valleys. Initiatives undertaken to erase such splits that always weaken the voice of resistance have never been successful. The center plays along these affiliations to control groups and play one against the other. There are at least 30 small militant groups or undergrounds or UGs as they like to call them in Manipur. For them to have a strong cadre base, they forcefully and through various other means recruit children. The recruitment of children in Manipur is a fairly recent phenomenon. And by recent, I mean about 10 years. From 2007, underground groups started forcefully recruiting children. It came out in open in 2008, when parents started going to the local police station to register a case when their children went missing. It was at this point, a militant outfit arranged a meeting that meant to show all was well with the boys, which meant that they were carrying guns and smiling. As we will see in the coming video clip in 2008, an underground group called the People's Revolutionary Party of Kangley Park paraded before the media a group of young men, young boys rather, who'd gone out, uh, a group of young boys, and about 20 of them, and they gave rehearsed answers that they had joined the militant group on their own. The militant group also said that these boys were under the education wing and were being trained to be perfect men. Action, good action. It's easy to get
It was the same answer I got at a militant camp near Burma border in 2014. This 13-year-old boy is part of a militant group that is in an apparent ceasefire with the Indian government. He told me that he was fighting to serve his country and he was happy doing what he was doing and not being forced to do it. In fact, he loves his life. It was the same answer I got over and over again from every child soldier I saw at this camp. They are trained to lie about their age. Only when someone from senior from the outfit is not around these boys, sometimes they forget and speak the truth. They even have a fixed routine of drills and training that they receive. In fact, some of them, at least on the surface, are quite thrilled to be with guns. Before I went to this camp, I spoke to three children who had managed to escape from another training camp in Burma. These were three boys, all in their early teens, who left their village, lured away on the promise of unspecified employment and the pledge that in exchange for their labours, their parents would be taken care of. The job as it was, as it turned out, was one of killing. The boys were taken by a recruiting agent and there are many who are spread across villages in Manipur, deep into the jungles of Burma for military training. Again, this was a ragtag army waging a war against India and this was the People's Revolutionary Party of Kangli Park, a banned rebel outfit. They're fighting for a separate homeland in Manipur, at least that's what they say. 15-year-old Tomba told me that they took me and my two other friends to a temple and apparently the boys had to vow never to run away. The three boys were kept in a small room with a television set and wooden beds for two days. On the third morning, they were forced into a car and crossed the Burma border near the town of More. After walking for miles, they reached a training camp where they met seven more boys of their age. Life in the training camp was hard. They had to wake up early for physical training and the food was inadequate. But there were slightly bigger boys with gun guns in smart army habits. The guns and the jackets I liked, I was told I would have one of my own. That was what Tomba's friend told me, who along with Tomba and the other boy has now been released. This is how child soldiers are being recruited in Manipur and also in some other parts of Northeast India, brainwashed and then used for but used by these insurgent outfits. In 2012, 10 boys were taken forcefully to an insurgent training camp in Burma. These three were lucky, and pressure from local rights groups sometimes forced their release. 19 children were recruited in 2008. That was the video which we saw. Today, the numbers have soared. The Asian Center for Human Rights says that there are at least 500 child soldiers in my assessment, the numbers are even more. 30 groups with 20 children each would be at least 600 child soldiers. And why do children get into this? If they are convinced and thrilled by the guns and the life, it is very difficult to get them back, says Ani Mangshatabam, who chairs the Child Welfare Committee in Manipur. Even if they come back, they and their families are always at risk from the rebels. What goes on in the mind of families? When in the camp near Burma, I managed to convince the camp leader to allow me to take one boy to meet his mother. This 14-year-old boy, seen with his mother, had escaped from his family because his father married someone else. He wanted to join the underground outfit and take revenge. His mother, who has married someone else now, is helpless and knows how risky it is for a son to be with an underground outfit. Yet. This is the only arrangement that works out for them. And with boys, increasingly girls are being recruited. And that finally brings us to the story of Sana Handi and Alice. In March 2013, a 15-year-old girl from Manipur, Sana Handi Khaidam, went missing. Within days of her disappearance, her mother received a call from the Revolutionary People's Front, the political arm of the People's Liberation Army of Manipur. Sana Hanbi, they informed the mother, was in their training camp in Burma. That same day in March, 14-year-old Alice Kame, a school friend of Sana Hanbi, disappeared as well. Her mother, seen in this photograph, 
received a similar call. These are Alice's parents. The local police said that they would try their best to get the girls back, but two years on, nothing has changed. Our hands are tied, we can't go into Burma and rescue the girls, says Titus Kame, who is part of a local rights group campaigning for their release. New Delhi refuses to recognize the existence of child soldiers and insists that there are legislative provisions that prevent involvement of children in armed conflict. The on-ground reality, as we see, is very different. So what happens in these camps when the girls are taken? There are immediately questions which come to mind about sexual violence and torture. I have spoken to girls who have come back or managed to escape from camps. And some of my fears, not all, have unfortunately come true. Last year, I traveled out of Imphal to meet some girls who managed to escape from training camps. This little girl, only 14, was trained to fire weapons like AK-47s. I have no problems. I can lift all of them and I know how to use them. That's what she told me. She was caned for instilling discipline sometimes 75 times a day. She managed to escape but has had not the courage to go back to her actual village because of fear that the rebels will trace her back. Girls are definitely tortured in camps. I traveled to another location to speak to another girl who was apparently witness to a story of a child soldier being killed, but she refused to speak. Fear is a huge factor that plays in the lives of child soldiers and their families when they come back home. And in a state like Manipur, heavily militarized and always under the counterinsurgency glare, where armed forces are constantly violating the rules, these families and the little ones are in a tight corner. The State Human Rights Commission in Manipur has been shut down, and this is in a state that has extrajudicial killings, rapes, and human rights violations every year. It has been shut down because apparently there are no funds to run it. Representatives of insurgent groups have asked campaigners in Manipur to lie low on the issue of child soldiers. Their message is simple, back off. And despite India's attempt to fence part of its border with Burma to prevent the free movement of militants, not much has changed. The recruitment of children into insurgent armies does not upset the political equilibrium in New Delhi. Other than their families, no one really cares about the children who go missing only to reappear in uniform, armed and at the same time, piteously vulnerable. Those who come back, like Johnson, with whose escape we began this talk, are harassed by the state police. The legitimacy of surrendered or escaped cadres remains unclear. And it has happened that they have been killed before by the state police commandos insisting that they're still working for out outfits they have escaped from. In fact, with a human rights activist last year, I was trying to coordinate a release plan for Alice and that, has never, that never took off. Last we heard from the outfit, PLA, about her, was she was in Mandalay, married to a carder. As for Sana Hanbi, her friend, there is no news and it is believed that she remains in the training camp in Burma. Thank you. Well, India is a signatory to the optional protocol to the prevention of uh, use of children in armed conflict. And there have been 14 UN special rapporteurs who visited Manipur, and all of them have asked for a repeal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. India clearly says that it has legislative provisions which prevents children being recruited 
So the ground reality, as we see, is different. And also the numbers are far less to actually upset an equilibrium. If it is a story of, say, just two girls being recruited, and if the focus is something else, which is a trade, like the Lucist policy, then it would require something more to actually get these girls out. The Burmese government and the Indian government, they have a very strange equation. First of all, in the Burmese army, for one, they use a lot of child soldiers. And also, when you have all these insurgent outfits in Burma, they are often used by the Burmese government to actually fight their own wars, because there are other factions within Burma who are sort of uh, opposed to the Burmese government or the military regime, which is now the government. So it's... it's uh, it's something which has never taken off. So there's very much rest on that side of the country, isn't there? It's, but, I mean, everyone's actually embracing Burma, more so we're looking away from the human rights. That's primarily to get a toehold in Burma. Yeah. And, uh, so also, in a sense, to counter an apparent Chinese threat or Chinese influence in Burma. But uh, that's the story which is erasing these, uh, these issues. Who, who funds these groups? Uh, so the initial funding, that's a very good question. I mean, it's from extortion. There's also initial funding which came in when it began in the 60s and then midway in the 80s also <laughs> from the given refuge by groups in Bangladesh the Director of General Forces Intelligence, the Bangladeshi Secret Service. So they were giving them training. The ISI was also involved at one point of time. And uh, so there are sort of various sources through which the funding have happened. That was, yeah, Nagaland. Yes, there was. In terms of, are you talking about uh, the talks in 19, uh, post-1956? They just, um, they managed to convert some of the Nazis, whose famous characteristic is they're unable to tell a lie. I remember my colleagues saying. Well, that's a lovely characteristic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, I mean, I don't know how to respond to that. In the sense, like, yeah, there have been missionaries there for quite some time, and... Uh, Yet the, the truth is coming out now. Arjun, could you call it for, could you clarify for us? Admittedly, Nagaland borders Myanmar, but what is the interest in Myanmar in promoting this sort of rebellious activity, and particularly amongst the children of Nagaland? It's a low intensity conflict, for one, what I have been underlining. And for Burma, it, uh, just uh, to give them refuge to some of these training camps, uh, to give refuge to some of these militants and uh, give them space for training camps. Uh, beyond that, they are often used, as I said, for their internal conflicts. So that's an interest which baffles me that why they would actually engage in this and not get these uh, camps dismantled. But uh, this is something which drags on. The Human Rights Watch, yes, when it used to be influential. Human Rights Watch, now they do work in other areas, but yes, they are. They are pretty, pretty They are. They've done some reports on this, and in fact, also in Manipur particularly, I didn't mention in the course of my talk that there is this activist who's been on a hunger strike for the last 15 years. That's, her name is Iram Shamila, and she's force-fed through a cocktail of medicines through a tube and uh, she, she's not had a morsel of food in the last 15 years, not even a drop of water. And so Amnesty International, in fact, uh, uh, announced her as a prisoner, prisoner of conscience. So, so there is 
a little bit of interest from Amnesty International as well as Human Rights Watch, but that really hasn't moved things on the ground. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act is also an act which is used in Kashmir. It was introduced in Kashmir in 1990. What happens to these children as time goes on? Do they, they form a separate military unit or, do they, or what happens? They, they get trapped into this life because they are not trained, they don't have any other life skills but to just do what they're doing, move around with this army. Often they sort of die a natural death and uh, they get killed in conflict or they just like uh, stay on. If, as we heard, they move out of uh, the outfits, there is some of them stay in, do some other work in Burma. That's what they do. When they come back to, when they come back to Manipur, if at all, they come back to their homes, they are often harassed by the state police for information. That's also one reason if some of these outfits they want to release, say if they want to release Alice and Sana Hanbi, they would not release them fearing that then because there's no proper rehabilitation process in place, then what will happen is the more information, there's a paranoia on both sides, that more information will go out and these people would just like constantly <laughs> ask them questions or hound them thinking that what next these outfits are going to do. That's scary, yeah. You appear on um, the society's website as, as a lecturer and a group. And, uh, How many of you have been to India's Northeast? How many of you have been to India? Only the sad, not the north. Okay. It's not as scary. I mean, it's not that bomb bombs are going off the moment you land there. It's a beautiful part of the country. The sad bit is that it's this conflict which kind of drags on and it's not really. Uh, it's not something which you notice the moment you land there, but uh, that's the sad bit that it's just, uh, it's, there's a tremendous amount of apathy about this group of people. What's the occupations of, of the people and if the children need an occupation, what, what would they be doing if they didn't join the army? Well, there is a huge amount of unemployment in these states and the opportunities are less and they would either be in farming or they would try, ironically, try and get into the state police force. <laughs> what sort of education are meant for supplying uh, the state? I mean, you have your schools, you have your colleges. Yeah. Now, it depends on the quality of schools and colleges you have hmm. with a curfew and an army act, and it's, it's very difficult. And if you're also growing up in a space in which you sort of every hundred meters you see a gun, then it's something, it just, it affects you in various ways. So may I ask our audience to join me in thanking you Ajit for your talk. Uh, Thank you for making the time and coming for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.